Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. ever. Amen. Almighty God, to you, to you all, all hearts are open, all desires known, and, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. May God be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for your servant Channing Moore Williams, whom you call to preach the gospel to the people of China and Japan. Raise up in this and every land evangelists and heralds of your kingdom, that your church may proclaim the unsearchable riches of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our lesson. stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, o Lord Christ. Christ. Jesus said to the people, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. Well, tonight, uh, for this uh, first week in, uh, in Advent, we are going to commemorate an event that happened 40 years ago tonight. Actually, it was happening probably right now, right around this time, none other than the martyrdom of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, four American church women in El Salvador. This happened on December 2nd, 1980. Some of us remember it. I was just about to turn 11 years old, and I remember it. It was a horrendous, horrendous thing when the story came out. Uh, it was just terrible on so many levels. Uh, you, when we think about 1980, we think about, well, we've just, we had just gotten through the tumultuous 70s. We thought things had maybe settled down a bit. Certainly in Central and South America, we thought things had settled down. Guess what? They had not. And this only brought uh, to the forefront not only what was happening down there, but it really brought it to Americans' uh, attention. Now, of course, the previous March, March 25th of 1980, uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero had been assassinated in El Salvador as well. So it was a violent time. But for some reason, these four church women were really resonated with a lot of people. And when it was discovered who killed them and who was funding them, it even hit a little closer to home. But we'll talk about all that in a bit. We're, first of all, just going to talk about uh, the, the three sisters and the lay person who died. And uh, they were none other than uh, Sister Mara Clark, Sister Ida Ford. They were both Mary Noel sisters. Sister Dorothy Castle, who was an Ursuline sister. And Jean Donovan, who was a lay uh, lay worker with the Mary Noel order, and uh, she was from Florida, I believe. So we're going to hear a little bit about all of them. The quote, of course, comes tonight from Sister Mara Clark. One cries, Lord, how long? And then, too, what creeps into my mind is the little fear, or big, that when it touches me pers very personally, will I be faithful? Very sad to hear that, considering what would be happening. On a December morning in 1980, a small assembly of priests, nuns, and peasants gathered in a cow pasture in El Salvador to witness the exhumation of four North American women. One by one, their broken and disheveled bodies were dragged from the shallow grave. Sister Mara Clark and Sister Ida Ford, both Mary Noel sisters, Sister Dorothy Castle, an Ursuline sister from Ohio, and Jean Donovan, a lay missioner uh, who was from Cleveland, Ohio, they had been missing since December 2nd, when Dorothy and Jean, in their distinctive white minivan, had left for the airport in, El in San Salvador to pick up Mora and Ida on the return from a meeting in Nicaragua. Two days later, some peasants alerted church authorities and led them to the site of this hasty burial. Each woman had followed a very different path. Mora and Ida had spent years in mission in Nicaragua and Chile. <coughs> Dorothy Castle was the longest in El Salvador. Jean Donovan, only 27, had wrestled with the possibility of marriage and the security of a lucrative career before choosing instead to remain in El Salvador. But for each one, called by Christ to live out her faith in solidarity with the poor, the path had led to that same cow pasture. It was a possibility that all had wrestled with and faced up to. After all, they had all, to one, one extent or another, been touched by the witness of Archbishop Oscar Romero, assassinated only nine months before. In words which Sister Ida Ford quoted on the night before she died, he said, One who is committed to the poor must risk the same fate as the poor. And in El Salvador, we know that the fate of the poor signifies to disappear, to be tortured, to be captive, and to be found dead. She said that the night before. She quoted him the night before she died mm -hmm. in such a way. Mm -hmm. The death of the four women had an enormous effect on the North American church, galvanizing opposition to U.S. funding for the Salvadorian government. And that's an important thing. These uh, National Guardsmen who killed these women were funded by the U.S. government. This was not the first time this happened. This had been happening for many, many years. And now this wasn't just a political thing, a Republican thing or a Democrat thing. Jimmy Carter was the Democrat president in 1980 still. So all the American governments up to this point had been supporting uh, guerrilla tactics in these countries, going all the way back to 1973, when Salvador Allende in Chile was overthrown by Augusto Pinochet, who was funded by the Nixon government at that time. So things like this had been happening for many, many years in, in, uh, in Central and South America. Uh, but at the time, the deaths provoked a backlash uh, on the part of apologists for these policies. As one American official noted, the nuns were not just nuns, the nuns were also political activists. On behalf of the Frente, the guerrillas, 
The, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State went so far as to describe a prominent theory that the church women may have been killed in exchange of fire after they were believed to be running a roadblock, which was not the case by any sense of the word. The prominent the uh, theory had little to do with the readily determined facts of the case. The four women were targeted for assassination by Salvadoran, Salvadoran officers. The soldiers, dressed in civilian clothes for a quote-unquote special assignment, had followed the sisters on their way home from the airport. That the women were killed many hours later in a different place, that they were shot in the head at close range, and that before being killed, two of them were raped. In fact, the four women were anything but political activists. Their work in support of the Salvadoran church involved ministering to the needs of refugees, shepherding priests on the run, delivering supplies, offering solace to isolated and terrified catechists. These were nightmare years in El Salvador. The women's work confronted them with scenes from hell. They saw villages where the security forces had committed massacres and then refused to allow the survivors to bury the dead. Uh, um, the, the one day, sister, wrote Sister Morrow, passing a little lake in the Jeep, I saw a buzzard standing on a top of a floating body. We did nothing but pray and feel. They each had identified with the church's preferential option for the poor, believing that the effective witness to the gospel was inseparable from the witness to life and solidarity with the oppressed. In El Salvador, this was enough to label one a subversive. Now, I'm going to pause there because there was a lot in that, that paragraph. Uh, this whole siding with the poor, which they definitely saw their, their mission as being, is of course, and I'm, this is the whole point of all of this, is exactly what Jesus tells us all to do over and over again. And he, also poor, suffered the same fate because of this very, this same, same system, essentially. So the sisters knew this. They were fully aware that these were the possibilities that might happen to them. And yet, in bearing witness to the cross, they were also witnesses to the resurrection. Among the believing poor of El Salvador, there was not only death, but a faith and a stubborn hope that inspired them to carry on, or at least kept them from fleeing. As Sister Ida wrote to her 16-year-old niece, this is a terrible time in El Salvador for youth. A lot of idealism and commitment are getting snuffed out here now. The reasons why so many people are being killed are quite complicated, but there are some clear, simple strands. One is that people have found a meaning to live, to sacrifice, struggle, and even die. And whether their life spans 16 years, 60, or 90, for them, their life has had a purpose. In many ways, they are fortunate people. Brooklyn is not passing through the drama of El Salvador, but some things hold true wherever one is, and at whatever age. What I'm saying is that I hope you can come to find that which life that, that which gives life a deep meaning for you, something that energizes you, enthuses you, enables you to keep moving ahead. So Jean Donovan, at 27, was the youngest of the four and the only laywoman among them. From a privileged background and with a degree in business and a promising career, she had been drawn to the mission in El Salvador and stayed on even when the risks became clear. Two weeks before her death, she wrote, several times I have dreaded to leave, I could almost expect, I could almost, ex I, I could, I almost could except for the children, the poor bruised victims of adult lunacy. Who would care for them? Whose heart would be so staunch as to favor the reasonable thing in a sea of their tears and loneliness? Not mine, dear friend, not mine. The history of the church is written in the blood of the martyrs, but these four women represented a different kind of martyrdom, increasingly common in our time. Their murderers dared to call themselves Christians, indeed defenders of Christian values, and they died not simply for clinging to the, the, uh, the true faith, but for clinging, like Jesus, to the poor. That is what they did. That was the sisters, and they were an amazing group of women, um, but I think more than anything else, uh, what we find, and we oftentimes commemorate martyrs on our Wednesday night masses, uh, martyrs are people who, as we know, are witnesses to Christ. That is what it means to be a martyr. You witness to Christ with your very blood. That is exactly what these four women were doing in El Salvador. And 
By doing so, they had a choice. Each one of them could have left. They didn't have to stay there. They were, they were sisters from fairly prominent orders in, in the United States. They did not have to be there. If things got bad, they, each one of them could have left at any point. They chose to stay there, knowing full well what the consequences of their staying meant. And, and in this case, they all paid a price for doing that. But as we know, any of us who have studied church history, we know that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That is the basic tenet of our Christian faith. And in this case, these four women inspired so many generations of Christians, of people to say, you know what, I want to serve in the church, I want to serve people, I want to serve the underprivileged, I want to serve the least of these. That is what Jesus calls us to serve over and over and over again. Now certainly I can say for myself, I think they were at least to some extent influential in my own uh, calling to the priesthood. Uh, this had opened, happened only about three years before I was called to the priesthood. And I remember that oftentimes in those first years when I was called at age 13, um, that these sisters came up in my mind. Every year the anniversary of their deaths came around, I remember them, and I still remember them. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been 40 years already now since they passed, but uh, their voice and their witness is still so strong and still so vital. Even if all the issues that happened in El Salvador 40 years ago are gone politically, what they stood for still stands firm and clear for all of us. And for that reason, they deserve to be remembered, they deserve to be commemorated, and I hope that they still inspire people to serve Christ in whatever ways they can in this world. Uh, I'm very grateful for their witness, I'm grateful for who they were, um, but I still have to say that as, uh, as toughened as I've been by sharing stories about martyrs and uh, and different things that we commemorate on Wednesday nights, the story of their martyrdom still is raw. It still feels so horrendous. Um, there's just something really horrible. And if you read some of the reports and the details of what happened that night, it's terrible, absolutely horrendous. There was a movie, there had been a couple of movies made about it, and I highly recommend you look them up. Uh, there was a movie done about Gene Donovan in which um, Melissa Gilbert played Gene Donovan. Uh, called The Roses in December or something like that. Look that one up. That's a good one. I remember seeing that. That was a made-for-TV movie back in the 80s. Uh, there was also a movie back in the late 80s called Salvador with James Woods. Uh, there's a really graphic scene about the murders in that particular film, so I don't highly recommend that one, but if you can stomach it, it's a really powerful film about what was going on in El Salvador at that time. Um, but all of it is, you know, uh, those are just a couple of the things. Uh, we, we need to just remind ourselves, though, of that this is sometimes the price one pays to be a Christian. This is the price one pays in following Christ. Because we can't forget the fact that when we follow Christ, we follow him to the cross. And whatever our cross might be in our lives, that's what it is. And for them, this was their cross that they had to endure as well. But we also have to remember just as much that beyond the cross is life, beyond the cross is resurrection, beyond the cross is life unending. And that's exactly what the sisters would want us all to remember as well. Their story doesn't end with their death. Their story doesn't end with them bringing those bodies out of that ditch. Their story continues on and they live in a place of light inaccessible with their Lord and that their lives did make a difference in the lives of the people that they serve. And so in that sense, I'm very grateful for them as well. Uh, we're going to close tonight with a prayer for all the church women in El Salvador. And I do also want to say that, yes, we're commemorating these four North American church women, but there were countless scores of people in El Salvador, Salvadoran people, who were being murdered as well. Thousands of people were being murdered at that time, and we have to remember them as well. And that's what the sisters also would want us to not forget about. So we're going to close tonight with especially for the prayers for these four women, but for all the martyrs of El Salvador. So let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who kindled the flame of your love in the heart of your holy martyrs, uh, the church women of El Salvador, and all the martyrs in El Salvador, grant to us, your humble servants, a like faith and power of love, that we who rejoice in their triumph may profit by their example. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Let us now stand and profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. During this season of Advent, let us pray for God's people throughout the world. Lord Christ, hear our prayers for the Anglican Communion, and especially the Episcopal Church, and for all members of this church. We pray this evening especially for all bishops, priests, and deacons, and for the holy people of God. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Hear our prayers for this congregation of St. Stephen's, that we may grow in our love of you, and that our service to others may be pleasing in your sight. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Hear our prayers for the sick, the hungry, and the oppressed, and for those in any need or trouble, praying especially this evening for Josh, Sandy, Greta, Tanya, and Virginia. Lord Jesus, come and with me. Hear our prayers for our families and our friends and those who have commended themselves to our prayers. Lord Jesus, come with me. Hear our prayers for those who have died. Remembering especially this evening, Bob. Grant him your eternal light, which we in this season long for. Lord Jesus, come with me. Hear our own intentions, repeated either silently or aloud. Lord Jesus, come quickly with all those in every generation in whom you have been honored, especially with Mary, your blessed mother, Stephen the martyr, and all saints, and for grace to glorify you, O Christ, in our own day. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Come, O come, Emmanuel. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the vine and the bread of life. Come, living Savior, come to your world which awaits you. Amen. Amen. And now let us confess our faith, or excuse me, confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy. We confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Amen. <laughs> Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of Christ be always with you. And also, also with you. you. Peace, everybody. Peace. Please be seated. Just a few announcements before we continue with our service. Uh, first and foremost, as you know, we are uh, uh, having our Wednesday night mass tonight. Uh, we did say James was going to be playing, but James, poor James, got his second shingle shot. And I know what it's like because I had my first shingle shot, and I know the, the effects of it. So poor James was running a little bit of a fever, and I said, you know what, James, you got to stay home. He knew he had to stay home. He didn't need me to tell him that. But uh, he stayed home, so we'll have him next week here to play. Uh, we are missing him. It's not quite Advent without James playing some music for us. But... Uh, We'll, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, 
looking for him next week. Uh, of course, on Sunday, but we're looking for when next Wednesday night during Advent. <coughs> uh, of course, we have suspended all in-person worship, uh, and we will be continuing that at least for the near future. Some people have been asking me, are we going to be continuing that through Christmas? And I think we will, because I'm pretty sure these numbers are not going to be going down for a solid two weeks before Christmas. Um, that is the basis, that is the, uh, the litmus test for when, whether we're going to reopen the parish for uh, worship again to in-person worship will be two weeks of steady decreases in COVID cases in North Dakota. So that will be the basis. Uh, so be watching that. Maybe there will be a Christmas miracle and something can happen. But I'm right now we're just kind of saying no. There, we'll just be doing it all live stream. And you know what? I'd rather have people just stay at home and be safe. And you know, people might like just staying at home on Christmas Eve and watching Christmas Eve Mass from home. So uh, sometimes I wish I could just do Christmas Eve Mass from home. That would be fun. But all for Jesus. We can do it. Uh, Let's just do it at your place. <laughs> sure. We could. I have a little oratory in my there we go. my basement. So. Anyway, I, we're not going to do that. Uh, let's see. This coming Sunday is, of course, in-gathering Sunday for our pledges. So if you haven't uh, turned in your pledges, please, please turn in your pledges. Turn in your pledge cards. Uh, you do not have to necessarily send your card in. Uh, you can just even drop an email to Laura Nylander and just let her know how much you're planning on pledging. Uh, that will be enough. You can do it through um, PayPal or whatever, however you want to, to pledge this year. Just uh, please do plan on pledging. We need your pledges, of course, during this time of COVID especially. And you'll be getting a letter from me later this week uh, asking everybody to pledge. So I'm sorry that we're having you do this, but that is pledge time. And after this coming week, we might be asking you still to pledge, but we won't be, won't be pushing it as hard as we have these last couple of weeks. You only get this one time a year, so we're just going to take advantage of it while we can. So uh, if you haven't pledged yet, please do send it in. If you have pledged, thank you very much for doing so. Uh, let's see, what else is going on? Uh, well, that's about it. I think we've covered Christmas, we've covered everything. Uh, next week we have kind of an interesting saint, I'm not gonna tell you who it is yet, but an interesting little commemoration next week for Wednesday night as well, so that is very good. Stay tuned. Stay tuned, I, 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 I wanna dangle it in front of you a little bit so you'll come back next week for uh, Annette, do you have anything you want to share? Is there any, uh, John, anything we should be sharing? Not that I can think of. I think we're pretty good. Uh, it's very intimate. Uh, I always loved our Wednesday nights. We always would have a different preacher on Wednesday nights. Uh, we can't do that this year. Uh, maybe, maybe Annette would be interested in preaching one Wednesday night. Because sure. you always like preaching about one of our Advent saints, I know. So I we'll talk about that. So okay. all of a sudden, see, thinking out loud right there in the announcements. We're, we're organic in what we do here, so. <laughs> Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God.
Blessed are you, O God of all creation. Through goodness we have this bread to offer, which the earth is given and human hands have made. Become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, God, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness you have through your goodness we have this wine to offer, the fruit of the vine and work of human hands. To become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. Come, Almighty God, our sanctifier, and bless this sacrifice now made ready for your holy name. Liturgy continues on page six on the booklet. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. We bless you and we praise you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant, because you sent your beloved one to, pre to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs of everlasting Christ, that when he comes again in power and great triumph, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his coming. And so this day we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, Lifting our voices to magnify you as we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You look with favor upon Mary, your willing servant that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, your holy child. Living among us, he loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the, night he was handed, on the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. <laughs> Supper was ending, Jesus took a cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me.
Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Stephen the Martyr, all the blessed martyrs of El Salvador, and all your people from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. This is the Lamb of God. This is the one who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who are called to this supper. And at this time, let us pray for all those who cannot receive Holy Communion at this time. Lord Jesus, be present with those who long to be here and receive your holy presence in this Eucharist. Come spiritually into their hearts and let them know your healing, loving, and life-giving presence. And never let them be separated from you. On page 10, let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. May Almighty God, by whose providence our Savior Christ came among us in great humility, sanctify you with the light of his blessing, and set you free from all sin. Amen. Amen. 
May he whose second coming in power and great glory we await, make you steadfast in faith, joyful in hope, and constant in love. Amen. Amen. May you who rejoice in the first advent of our Redeemer, at his second advent be rewarded with unending life. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Let us now go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.